Hello and a very warm welcome to LMT Royal YouTube channel. There are some people who posted demeaning comments yesterday. It came from those who did not even watch the whole time event. The Sussexes did a great job hosting together and independently while we learnt from the experts. It wasn't all Megan. For instance, Harry spent more than 20 minutes talking to Maria Ressa and Renee DiResta. The Sussexes were involved in developing the theme, selecting guests and brainstorming topics for this edition of Time 100 Talks. Maria Ressa is a, the executive editor of Rappler magazine. A former CNN reporter, Maria co-founded the Philippine paper Rappler. In 2012, Maria and three other journalists exposed ties between the Chief Justice of the Philippines and wealthy businessmen. As a result, he was removed from his position of power. Maria and her staff continue to use journalism to discuss their government and expose corruption, despite consistent pushback and physical threats from Philippine President Duterte. Maria was one of the journalists to win Time's Person of the Year in 2018, along being harassed, jailed, and now found guilty in a cyber libel case by President Duterte in an attempt to silence her and other journalists in her country. Renee DiResta is the research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory. She investigates the spread of malign narratives across social networks and assists policymakers in understanding and responding to the problem. The Sussexes aren't here talking as if they're experts and even said they aren't experts themselves during the event. The Sussexes have actively gone out of their way behind the scenes to seek out information regarding social media and the tech field in order to increase their understanding. We do urge you to watch the full video on my YouTube channel. Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, here with me are Maria Ressa, a journalist and the CEO of the news site Rappler. Uh, and Rene Duresta, uh, the research manager at the Stanford Int uh, Internet Observatory. Both are experts in and witnesses of how narratives that spread on media platforms are having serious impacts both online and off. Welcome, guys. Rene. Nice very nice to see you again. How's the little one? Oh, she's great. Good. Excellent. And no doubt you're so busy. <laughs> I, every I'm time. Sold. <laughs> So busy. And, and Maria, this is the first time that we've met. Um, the, the, the two of you have so much responsibility and so much going on in your lives. How how are you? Are you are you? How has this last year been? Uh, you know, at least for me, on June fifteenth, in the middle of the lockdown in the Philippines, it's the it's the longest in the world and among the strictest. But in the middle of that, I was convicted of cyber libel. It's uh, for a crime, a crime that didn't exist when we published the story eight years ago, a story I didn't write, edit, or supervise. And now I could go to jail for up to six years. So um, having said all of that, you know, yes, I have eight arrest warrants. I am fighting each case in court and connected to what you're saying, all of these the weaponization of, of the law was actually enabled by the bottom-up attacks on social media that began in 2016. And uh, that's progressed and we've seen the evolution. So having said that, um, it's good. Why? Because we just breathe it in like polluted air and we find the way to fight back, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you sort of took the words uh, right out of my mouth, uh, Maria. You, you, know, you are a recognized advocate for the freedom of press, which is absolutely critical and vital to everyone all over the world. Um, and the, this summer, as you said, a Manila court uh, found you guilty of cyber libel, um, a charge that your teams argue was meant um, to silence you from exposing corruption in the Philippines, which you just touched on there. Um, what? What changes have you seen, uh, Maria, in how the news industry sees and carries out its duty to inform all of us? Um, we have never been uh, under such intense attack. So by next year, I'll have been a journalist for 35 years, right? I've worked in conflict areas. I've led teams in war zones. And at least in those areas, you know if the shooting is coming from here, how to protect yourself. In this environment, um, it's far more insidious and the, the tactics are the same globally and it is enabled by technology. So, you know, in our case in the Philippines, uh, exponential attacks on social media, bottom up, uh, a lie told a million times becomes a fact. That began happening in 2016, so four years ago. And in 2016, uh, they seeded the narrative journalist equals criminal. 2017, you have 
President Duterte himself saying the same thing top down in his State of the Nation address. In 2018, the weaponization of the law happened. 11 cases filed against us. 2019, I had eight arrest warrants. I had I was arrested twice in a five week period. And uh, 2020, uh, I was convicted um, in the, one of the first cases. So journalist equals criminal. The world is turned upside down. I guess the, my main concern is this. I think journalists around the world have done our jobs. We have held the line. We are telling you the facts because without facts, you can't have truth. Without this, you can't have trust. Without any of these, democracy as we know it is dead. And I have been saying that for four years. I think the last part is with elections coming up in the United States, without facts, how can you have integrity of elections with this kind of insidious manipulation that's happening online? How can voters choose, right? How can we know that this is the will of the people? I mean, these are huge issues, right? And I think we need a, a global collective to try to deal with this. It's a, it's a war of information, right? One of which you've both been warning of for five years, more? Um, it's really, you know, I became a journalist because I knew information is power and I wanted to fight for justice. Uh, we shine the light. That's the mission of journalism. This time shows you more than at any other time that information really is power. And what happened, what triggered it is news groups lost our gatekeeping powers to technology and technology abdicated responsibility for protecting the public sphere. Beautifully said. Worrying, <laughs> but beautifully said. Um, Rene, uh, sort of switching to you for a second. Um, first, it's really nice to uh, nice to see you again after after our first little meeting uh, last month. But your your work is also so impressive and so needed as well as is your remarkable career of all the places where you've worked, all the places that you've been, and all the experience that you've gained from that as well. Um, you don't just dig deep; you dig the deepest, as far as I can tell. Um, and in most cases, in a, into the really unpleasant areas, um, which most other people um, certainly don't have to go to. But on that, thank you for, 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 for what you do. Thank you for, for, to both of you for what you do. But how, I mean, this is, this is really critical work that you're both doing. But Rene, you've informed policymakers, civil society leaders, academic institutions, and so many more. How have online platforms, and by extension, some uh, news outlets, enabled the spread of misinformation or propaganda? Yeah, so as Murray was describing this bottom-up uh, activism, uh, originally social platforms were a way for people to connect with each other. And there was an explosion and extraordinary social movements that came about as a result of that in the early days, right? And so we don't want to imply that that act of connecting people or that act of democratizing access, uh, the ability to create content, the ability to disseminate it, the ability to um, to bypass gatekeepers candidly, to, to get to make your voice heard, particularly if you were a member of a community that didn't have access to press. This was a global phenomenon that happened uh, on social platforms that they really enabled. But the downside of that, the unintended consequence, is when you connect everybody and when you make it possible for information to spread instantaneously, not everybody who is uh, you know, endowed with that power uses it responsibly. And so what you see is, um, is fake people begin to participate in the conversation. Fake media properties begin to spring up. Uh, because as Maria mentioned, this is a tool of power. And if you can control the narrative and if you can dominate the share of voice, then you can you can achieve real world objectives. Uh, for a while, people talked about the internet or social platforms as this thing that happened over there. Yeah, there were conspiracy theories, but that was just on the internet. Yes, there was some, you know, kind of wild claims and uh, harassment, hate speech, et cetera, et cetera. But that was just on the internet. Then we began to realize the extent to which um, what was happening online and offline, the tools of influence, the democratization of the ability to influence, and candidly, the democratization of propaganda meant that ordinary people could have a profound impact in shaping uh, the direction of leadership, the direction of policy, and the direction that their country was going. So that, so that, that, um, that we, I think we all agree, media is, is, is a huge responsibility, and it is a huge power, and, and, and it's a privilege. But the moment that it gets taken out of responsible hands, then then you have you have sort of 
un uncharted territory, chaos, one might describe it as. I think that's accurate. And I think a lot of where we are today is thinking about we have a brand new information environment. It's only about, you know, 10 years old or so, the social kind of social web. And whereas other, you know, there, whenever there's a new technological tool for the dissemination of information or propaganda, uh, there were there was kind of like a period of social upheaval while the world, you know, while societies kind of uh, began to understand how they could use it, what it was for, and where regulators began to think about how they would address it. And I think that we're in that pivotal period right now, trying to understand how to take the good and minimize the chaos, if you will, and, and achieve uh, an environment where people do have that freedom of expression, that ability to connect without some of the unintended uh, downstream harms that we've seen manifest as a result. And what is the what is the real effect of misinformation? What is it actually doing to us? Well, to, to either of you, Maria, perhaps you go first. Well, can I quickly, I think Renee is nicer than I am <laughs> in this one, right? <laughs> and, I, and I will say this because because uh, I'm living through it. You know, I, I really am, I, and I, I can compare it over 35 years. So what you call chaos, look, when journalists, when news organizations were the gatekeepers, uh, we had standards and ethics, values. Yeah. We were legally liable, right? Uh, if So we protected the facts. But what happened when technology took over is that they took the platforms and they didn't realize it, as Renée said, unintended consequences. But what they did is something journalists have never done, which is to willfully manipulate people, to use neuroscience, to build in. It's called optimizing growth and engagement. And I really hate the word engagement now, the way tech uses it. But they build it in. So what they do is they figure out the way we think and then really just gleefully figure out that, okay, well, uh, this these are the worst parts of human nature. Let's not just influence, let's take their data. So on every social media platform we put in our data, it is atomized machine learning takes it and builds a model of each of us. It knows us more intimately than we know ourselves. And then that model is pulled up by artificial intelligence into this pool where let's just say a company or a country has a message and the artificial intelligence will give the most vulnerable moment you have to a message and to the highest bidder sell it and you are nudged it's a feedback loop when you're nudged you can take the nudge or you cannot but either way whatever action you take goes right back into the machine i'm sorry so geeky about it and i know renee knows as much about this because we this has been years long conversations we've had i think the reality now is that the world is at a precipice uh i am paying the price for Silicon Valley's decisions, and there has to be accountability. We are fighting impunity in the Philippines, not just of our government that is killing people, the drug war, uh, our human rights groups say it's at least 27,000 people killed since last December, but we're also challenging the impunity of the platforms. Facebook in particular, 100% of Filipinos on the internet are on Facebook. Facebook is our internet. And you, know, you could say that Rodrigo Duterte and Mark Zuckerberg are, are on the same page as far as the threats to us are concerned. Okay, so, Maria, so in your in your experience and with all your connections, who are the leaders in preventing uh, the spread of misinformation? Which people, which organizations need a need a light sh uh, shone on them right now? Uh, you know, this is what's happening. Renee said it. It's creative destruction. I think we all have to accept that the world as we knew it is dead, and you know, in the same way, this year is the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima, Nagasaki. What happened? The entire world came together and we came up with Bretton Woods, with NATO, with the UN Declaration of Human Rights. This is another one of those pivotal moments. Uh, data is not oil, it is plutonium. And I'm paraphrasing uh, Jim Balsillie, who is the CEO of the company that did BlackBerry. He chose a business model that wasn't extractive of our behavior, right? So if it's plutonium and an atom bomb went off, Prince Harry, what would you do, right? This is, I guess I, I'm saying we all have a stake in this. 
every American going into elections. You can't just like think voting is enough. You're going to have to sit and ask yourself the same question I asked myself, which is, what will you sacrifice for the truth? What will you sacrifice for the facts? And in our case, we're really called on to sacrifice a lot. And Renee, what is what is the way that the the way that these platforms? But what I'm but what I'm hearing you say is the way that these platforms have almost hijacked uh, media, news, privilege, power, all of that. What is that doing to news organizations? Is there? I mean, there's, there's obviously there's a huge commercial incentive here based on almost industrializing news. Well, I mean, in the States, we've seen an extraordinary fragmentation of media. Um, we see, you know, it's, it's interesting, The all major media properties have um, presences on social media as well, where they kind of participate in the, that battle for attention. You know, you see headlines that are much more sensational, the actual substance of the article. A lot of the time, that's because they're competing. Nobody is going, you know, it's not like you pick up the newspaper, you're going to read it in its, you know, its paper form in its entirety. Or even, you know, people used to go to NewYorkTimes.com, Fox.com, CNN.com. Now people see what is curated for them. I think actually it's the, the combination of um, how the information is delivered to us in particular. You know, Maria refers to some of the targeting, advertising targeting incentives. Uh, and engagement, a lot of the ways that we see information is no longer a holistic view of the world by looking at the entirety of all of the, you know, coverage of a particular topic, even within one publication, we, you know, we don't have that necessary, that perspective. What we see are the things that are curated for us, which means that the feed, which is algorithmically ranking hierarchically what we are most likely to be receptive to or want to pay attention to. Uh, based on, again, you know, each of the platforms being roughly in competition with each other, uh, for our time and our attention. So that dynamic is very real. It is informed by the business model. Um, I think where we are today with news in particular though, um, as people, when, when, there's a, a, when there's a sense of crisis, which is since March, I mean, in the United States, there's been a constant sense of crisis is only increasing as we, as we uh, had these last three weeks into the election, people gather on social platforms. And they're there because they want to talk to their communities while consuming the news. So this is, you know, this kind of marriage of entertainment, social and information all being in the same place. And so the net effect of that is that they are seeing what is shared by their friends in their communities. So occasionally that means, you know, in a lot of cases, you'll have a very kind of narrow bubbly type view of what's happening in the world. But more than that, there's a constant desire for immediacy for uh you know knowing the truth instantaneously and that's actually that's um not how news reputable news works and so there's that demand this demand for every time i refresh my phone you know there has to be some new information i have to learn something new during COVID, it was you know what are the treatments what are the cures what's going to happen to my family now as we head into the election it's you know what is the what is the latest crazy story in the campaign uh, people expect reputable information instantaneously. And that is, you know, those those two things are intention. And I, I don't think that we have a, an effective way to resolve that in our curation or amplification uh, structures at this point. And Maria, that must, as a, as a journalist, that must be incredibly hard because there's, there's, there's this competition that has now been created where in order you have to get something online first and if you and if you don't then you lose out by however many millions of clicks and then commercially you lose out as well but then surely the pressure that's coming from above to get that story online as quickly as possible all of a sudden the importance of facts is sort of pushed pushed to the side so in, invariably there's this there's this struggle, this this whatever you want to call it, to try and to get the get the story first. And and even if it's even if it isn't a story, 24 hour news cycle, you've got to fill the space. So you've got to create the news. But you know, Harry, I would go one step further than that. I think that was the case in 2014, in 2015, when we were getting the rush to digitalization, when news was moving online. Rappler is a startup. We began it online in 2012 and we embraced Facebook. I'm just gonna rephrase something Renee said, which is think about it. This is the way I'm living through it, right? Meaning has been atomized. 
So everything a journalist does is torn apart into bits and pieces. And then it is the algorithm of delivery platforms, of social media, that decides the context for the sentences you write. That is, so we are no longer in charge of context or meaning, right? And that is the problem because when you have a democracy and an algorithm that is meant to exploit your weaknesses to keep you on the platform, when that is what determines the context of the messages you live, in, the, the messages that give meaning to your world, uh, you're really reduced to meaninglessness. And then aside from that, the designs of the platforms themselves actually encourage us against them, right? In the Philippines, we saw ourselves, like if you're pro-Duterte, you can use this for pro-Trump or anti-Trump. In 2016, in order to grow the social media platforms, they recommend friends of friends. Every single social media platform uses that. And if you do that, in 2016, the pro-Duterte people grew and they moved further right. The anti-Duterte people grew their platforms and they moved further left. And it went, and it went. And what's being torn apart here is the public sphere. That's why we have no shared facts. So what does that mean? No meaning, no context, or the context that is provided by uh, an algorithm that is opaque at best. We have no idea how it's manipulating us. Uh, and then I think- The, the, con last the context stripped away, right? The context yeah. Because of social media, I don't know how many characters you're allowed on, on on most of these things, but of course it's going to anger people. Of course it's going to cause divisiveness because what should be a story with context about this long gets shrunk down into one sentence or, or three sentences and it enrages people because they're, they're making opinions or decisions based on that, that instant hit as opposed to what the younger generation seem to be doing, which is, I've seen something somewhere, I'm gonna fact check that, I'm gonna go over here, okay, and I'm gonna go to somewhere else. So if you have two or three different areas to be able to compare it with, then great. But if you're just on one um, social media platform and you are unaware of your habits being learnt by the device, you're creating your own echo chamber, of which feels great, and you're therefore you're creating your own reality. And therefore, once again, it is impossible to be able to have a an argument or a discussion with somebody else because you are adamant that you are right because you've seen it on all of your news feeds, but those news feeds have been created for you. So it feeds into your cognitive bias, but I'll say one last thing on this, which is that the platforms actually spread lies laced with anger and hate faster and further than really boring facts. You know, journalists spend lifetimes learning how to tell stories so that you care. But we don't stand a chance in these delivery platforms. So I get emotional again, you know. So this is the problem. Anger and hate is part of it. The manipulation of our emotions is part of it. And what you talked about is a thinking slow process. Journalism is a thinking slow process that is trying to be distributed on a thinking fast platform. It, it's we are we are going to lose, which is why we have to demand enlightened self interest from Silicon Valley. Renee, go for it. <laughs> well, look, it's a, it's a, it, look, it's a it's a group effort, and and I and I, I and everybody else watching this can't thank you guys enough for for all of the work that you continue to do, the research, the the endless content that you have to go through to be able to find the truth or to be able to stop more of this from happening but there's been quite a this, quite a heavy subject for people to take on so in short to end with some optimism some hope this is this is a globe these are global platforms that have an ability or have connected people um all around the world so presumably handled the right way or managed the right way and you know, algorithms were built by humans so this idea that it can't be changed or it's it's now completely out of control one would hope is is actually false it is something can be done about this and then we have a world that is that is connected for the for all the right reasons so starting with you Renee, and then moving on to maria what is that that last piece of optimism and hope that you would that you would leave everybody watching this now um i think that really it's actually the it's the civil society and researchers and government and the cooperation that we've built over the last few years leading into 2020 in particular but since 2016 
I think that, you know, Maria is absolutely right. There is not accountability in the way that we need it to be. It's just not there yet. Uh, you In the U.S. in particular, I know this is the optimism part, so I don't want to be too negative, but um, but I mean, the very idea of a fact check is partisan now. It, it, is, it is perceived as censorship by vast swaths of the population. If somebody tells you what you've said is wrong, that is, uh, that is censoring your opinion, right? And then that is where we are. Um, I think that one of the you know, one of the things that we try to do at Stanford is we do try to work with the platforms so that we can make constructive suggestions so that at least in the near term, uh, we have a little bit more in the way of, of positive outcomes, particularly with these, you know, pick the, the, whatever the next crisis is. I think on the optimism front, though, we are also seeing so much awareness from the public, which is demanding accountability, but more than that, which is recognizing that they also have some agency, not a ton, not as much as they need, but Enough, I think, at this point where we're starting to see media literacy and efforts, as you mentioned, from the younger generation, uh, where they are doing that lateral searching, really making an effort to try to find out what's true by looking, at, you know, in a kind of plethora of places on the internet. And I think that as we continue to develop um, those programs and, you know, the younger generation kind of continues to take over, we're headed in the right direction. Uh, you know, uh, on my end, Harry, uh... Rappler started in 2012 and we had three pillars, technology, journalism, community. And now I can't give up because I'm, <laughs> we're gonna fight. And that is where the global battle should begin. Tech, demand accountability, demand regulations, demand enlightened self-interest. The second is journalism. We keep doing our jobs. Facts are incredibly important. And for the international community, help news groups survive this time period, right? And that's part of the initiative we have with BBC Media Action and Luminate to try to get a fund of a billion dollars annually to help independent media survive. And then the third, it was what, which is what Renee said, community. Civil society has to come together and we have to feed them facts. These are all connected. You know, this is the reason why I liked joining the real Facebook oversight board because there are, there are very strong civil rights activists. They're very strong academics and journalists. Our battle is combined. We are the tripods of democracy. I mean, beautifully said by, by both of you. Thank you to both of you for, for giving up um, your, your time to, to speak to me and to speak to us. Um, as I said before, the work you're doing is is incredible and so many people don't know what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So so thank you. Um, good luck with everything. Um, keep, keep smiling, especially you, Maria. I love the energy. Um, and yeah, look after yourselves and uh, no doubt we'll, we'll speak soon. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more LMT Royal videos about your favorite royals are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell, so you don't miss a single one. Don't stop.